Hi, I'm Travis Thurston, and we're talking about learning science in the classroom. Today's topic is dual coding. Alan Pavio's dual coding theory has been around for decades, uh, and when we talk about dual coding, really where we focus first of all is on working memory. Specifically, visual stimuli are, are an is an interesting place to start because when we're looking at an image or we're processing a video that we're watching, we actually create this visuospatial sketch pad in our working memory, and it's actually encoding that information directly into our working memory. And what's interesting about those visual stimuli is it processes in a synchronous way, which means that we can go back and retrieve that information uh, regardless of the order in which we, we saw it. So an image or a video, we can see all of that in our working memory quite well. In contrast, however, when there's verbal stimuli, so we're talking about words on a screen or a reading in a textbook, things of that nature, when we process those verbal cues, it's in a sequential pattern. So if you picture like an old reel-to-reel -reel or an audio cassette tape, it records the words or the sound in a very specific order. And that's how our working memory retrieves that, is in that specific order. Which, in contrast to that visual stimuli, uh, isn't as efficient. However, if we can connect those two, they operate separately, but if we can trigger those to connect, so to the visual and the auditory, this interesting thing happens when we learn that allows us to remember that much better in our long-term memory. So that when we need to retrieve that information later, it's much easier to process because it's dual encoded. So how do I get started in applying this into my classroom? First step is to cut. This is hard. This is actually talking about cutting content out of our class. In a lot of courses, there's quite a bit of content to cover. So we as, as instructors, as teachers, sometimes it's difficult for us to think about what we can actually cut because it's all so important. However, if we can identify certain pieces or certain items that maybe aren't as necessary for the students to need to process, and eliminate those out of our presentations, our lessons, our activities that actually reduces the load or the cognitive load in that working memory for our students that allows them to process more. So first step is to cut content. The next is a chunk. So along those same lines of cutting content, we're going to look at this information uh, in our lessons, and rather than try to hit every single step along the way, we're going to break that into two or even three different pieces, two, three different chunks for the students to process. This again eases that load on the working memory and allows the students to process or encode the information much better. The third is to coordinate. So much like, like this slide here, I'm using very simple fonts that are bold keywords easy to process visually. They're aligned nicely, so it's easy to visually process those. And I'm connecting the words with key images. So that's going to help us to, uh, in that encoding process in our working memory, to remember these much easier. Now how about a few other specific examples of how we can use this in our classroom? The first is a great one uh, with infographics. Now this can work in two different ways. One is you as the instructor using infographics for your students. Secondly, it would be actually having your students create the infographics themselves. So as you go through the lesson, have the students identify key points and have them create that infographic. Uh, have them consider a concept, the pros and cons. And again, align those nicely in, in an infographic form. Have the students identify specific parts of an event. And again, actually having them go through the process of drawing this out, writing the keywords, is really going to help with that encoding process. The next one is diagram. This is great for STEM fields, uh, where we take very complex information, like body systems, for example, and we break it down into a diagram. 
that can be used with visuals and keywords. So even breaking down cell structure and things of that nature, having the students actually go through the process of creating their own diagrams and identifying, again, is a great way for them to go through that dual encoding process. Graphic organizers are another great way. Think of mind maps or concept maps. Have the students find the similarities and the differences in the topics and actually visually create those in their notes. And then finally, creating timelines. This is a great one for history or other topics where you're, you're talking about cause and event. So this event leads to this event. And have the students actually create those timelines. Uh, again, is a great way to help with uh, that dual encoding process. So in summary, we know that visuals are powerful learning tools. Uh, they help our students to process, uh, communicate complex ideas uh, very succinctly. We also know that images can provide clarity and can connect concepts. Pick images and diagrams that are going to actually connect to the topics to help students remember that information so when they go back to retrieve it, it's going to be much easier for them. And then finally, those three items, cut, chunk, and coordinate. Think of how you can do this for your own class. These are some of the resources that I use for this presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about dual coding. Thanks.